So looking at the workshop objectives, hopefully today we're going to do some work around understanding the benefits of DBS um, and working together. Understand different referral routes when we need to refer somebody into DBS. Understand when a DBS barring referral should be made, including when your legal duty is met. And that's an interesting one because people sometimes think that you only have to refer if there is a legal duty. And we will cover that there are circumstances that even though that criteria is not met, you still can refer to DBS. Have an understanding about re regulated activity. And again, I apologise if people are already aware of that from last week's slide, um, but I think it is important to go back over it. Understand how to make a good quality referral. And have a clear understanding of the consequences of not making appropriate barring referrals and the cons consequences of being included in one or both barred lists. OK, so there's a bit there that we're going to, to cover. So introduction um, to DBS. Um, Disclosure and Barring Service has launched its new five year strategy, which you can see there. And it details our ambitions for 2025. It focuses on three key elements, which is our profile, our people and quality. The strategy details a number of actions that will be taken across the next five years. And our work provides significant prote protection to the public. And the delivery of this strategy will enable us to develop as an organisation improve the services we provide and support the contribution we make within the safeguarding community. So like, like every presentation, every training that you probably go to, at the end of it, we will talk about evaluation forms, but it is really, really key to us that people take a couple of minutes to fill in those evaluation forms. Um, it will be electronic and I will get it sent out to you um, through Patrick, but it's the comments that we feed back, that we get fed back to, that inform our strategies moving forward. So we really do take on board um, what people say to us. And that is really one of the reasons why regional officers have been appointed. Feedback in terms of that sometimes the DBS could be like a far reaching body and that there wasn't that on the ground link. Um, so that was listened to and hence the regional officers team has been developed, of which I'm your regional officer for Wales. So looking at the role of the DBS, um, this is the legislation that we've got up on the screen here that underpins everything that we do. And we have different pieces of legislation which govern our disclosure and barring functions. And it is complex, but we are working hard to try and support people and understand and applying this legislation. And we have developed a number of leaflets and guides, checks and referrals, etc., that are on the DBS website. And I will be providing you with the link to those um, again at the end of the presentation. OK, so DBS certificates and all our other disclosure products are produced under Part 5 of the Police Act. OK, DBS barred lists and other barring functions, which we're going to be looking at today, are allowed under the Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Act and the Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Order. Um, and we'll see for residents in Scotland, disclosure and barring functions are undertaken by Disclosure Scotland. For residents in Northern Ireland, disclosure functions are undertaken by Access NI. But the barring functions which we're looking at are undertaken by DBS for both Scotland and Ireland and England. OK, so we don't need to go into the full detail about the legislation, but it is good to know that when we make decisions, when applications come through to us in terms of barring, um, we are making um, decisions based on um, government legislation. Um, we're not just doing it because we think it's it's the thing to do at that time. OK, so we're going to have a little bit of a quiz now um, in terms of barring. So there's just going to be a few questions will pop up and we'll just go through them. Um, I can't see a chat room, so I don't know if people want to unmute and just shout an answer out. It's going to be a true or false or whether you just want to have a think about it yourself and think about what your answer would be. And then I'm going to give you the answers as we go along. So you'll be able to see whether your thinking was along the right lines or not. So we've got 10 questions um, and they're all going to come up at once. So please don't scroll down and look at number 10 before we've discussed number one. <laughs> That's the kind of thing I would do. Um, so, yeah, if we have a look at the quiz. Oh. Tell a lie. They're going to come up separate. They didn't in the in the um, presentation before. So true or false? There's been a concern with an employee which I have reported to the police, and therefore a DBS referral isn't needed. Do we think that's true or that's false? Anybody want to shout out? <laughs> false. Okay. Anybody else? 
Nope, Simons, you're absolutely right, it is false. It is essential that the DBS is informed of scenarios where the referring organisation has some evidence that an individual has posed a risk of harm, even if the organisation has informed the police of the situation, but sometimes no further action may be taken by the police. And this is because the burden of proof for the police and the Crown Prosecution Service requires that there is sufficient evidence to be able to prove beyond all reasonable doubt that an individual has committed a certain act or behaved in a similar way. However, in order to make a decision to place an individual on a barred list, the DBS only requires enough evidence to prove that on the balance of probability a person has committed the act, i.e. it's more likely that it occurred than not. So if the police do charge the individual, they would not automatically inform DBS of this and therefore it is important that DBS referral is still made. Okay. Number two, I have reported the abuse to the regulator stroke keeper of the register and therefore a referral to DBS isn't needed. Again, any takers for true or false? Okay, so this one is what this one is false. Although the regulator may, although they may not, <laughs> inform DBS of a case, this does not happen as a matter of course. The legal duty to make the referral sits with the regulated activity provider stroke personal supplier, therefore basically the employer. Even if the individual is banned from working within their sector, this does not prevent them from working in the future with children and or vulnerable adults in regulated activity. So if it's reported in to the keeper of a register, say, for example, a teacher, that, that keeper of the register or regulator may bar them from working in teaching but it may not bar them from working, say, in a voluntary youth group or something like that. So hence, it's really, really important that DBS still receive that referral. OK, number three, although the individual has resigned from their role and cannot cause any other harm within this regulated activity provider, I still need to make a referral to the DBS. True or false? True. True, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Condition one, your legal duty to make a referral, you withdraw permission for a person to engage in regulated activity with children and or vulnerable adults, or you move the person to another area of work that isn't regulated activity. This includes situations when you would have taken the above action, but the person was redeployed, resigned, retired or left. OK, if condition two is also met, i.e. relevant conduct and harm test, and you are a regulated activity provider, there is a legal duty to be for the referral still to be made. OK, and a lot of people think sometimes, well, actually, do you know what? That person's no longer in our employment and therefore we don't need to think about it. or We don't need to do it. But absolutely, um, it still falls under your responsibility to make that referral. OK, DBS only include individuals on the barred list, child and or adult if they have been cautioned or convicted of a serious offence. Any takers on this one? OK, this one is false. DBS do include individuals on one or both barred lists if an individual has been cautioned or convicted of a relevant offence, i.e. auto bar regulations 2009. However, the DBS will also consider discretionary referrals and disclosure information. So that's information that comes to light when an individual applies for an enhanced check with one or both barred lists. And we'll be looking at that further in today's session, because one of the things that we will be looking at is your discretionary referrals. So it is possible individuals who have got no cautions and convictions could be included in one or both barred lists. OK, number five. An individual could be included on one or both barred lists despite having no interaction with the police. I think that's true or false. True. Uh -huh. It is, absolutely. Same as above, same as the last question. The DBS does not only make decisions as to whether an individual should be included in one or both barred lists based on their criminal history. Certain cautions and convictions will result in the automatic inclusion on the barred lists. 
However, DBS can also receive information following what comes to light when an individual applies for an enhanced check with one or both barred lists. This is because they're looking to work in regulated activities. OK, so what happens there is when that check is done and if people are asking for the, a, a, an enhanced check on the barred list, they will take into account all sorts of different relevant information. So the person may have had no interaction with the police, but some other information may come to light where that would be pertinent to the, the outcome. I'm only able to make a referral to the DBS if the legal duty to do so is met. Have a go at this one, I think, even though I've already given you the answer in the introduction <laughs> for those that were listening. <laughs> Any takers? OK, this, this one is actually false. OK, so even if the duty to refer is not met, the legal duty to refer is not met, you can, if you think it's appropriate, make a referral to the DBS in the interests of safeguarding children and vulnerable adults. And DBS, we are required by law to consider any and all information that is sent to us from any source. This includes information sent where the legal duty to make a referral does not apply. So you may, when we go on to look at the legal duty, there are certain conditions and criteria that have to be met to create that legal duty. So even if they are not met, you should still consider the relevant employment and data protection laws and you may want to seek your own legal advice in relation to cases where you want to make that referral and the legal duty is not met. OK, but you would still have sufficient information to um, have a concern that the individual may cause or is likely to cause harm to a vulnerable adult or child. And again, as I say, we'll go on and we'll cover and we'll look at the um, legal duty, we'll look at relevant conduct and we'll also be looking at the harm test. So seven, the DBS can only consider including an individual in one or both barred lists if they have caused direct harm to a child or vulnerable adult in their care whilst working in regulated activity. Any takers? False. Um, yep, false, absolutely. Um, this is a bit wordy, how I respond to this one. So the legislation outright outlining relevant conduct includes, and this is where we get into a little bit of legislation, if repeated against or in relation to a child vulnerable adult would endanger the child vulnerable adult or be likely to endanger the child vulnerable adult, Therefore, harm could have been caused by an individual outside of regulated activity against someone who would not be deemed a child or vulnerable adult. However, if repeated against a child or vulnerable adult would likely to endanger them. So that's the legal bit. OK, so basically, in, in layman's terms, what it means in, is that if somebody outside of regulated activity, even though they may be employed in regulated activity, OK, say, for example, a, um, I don't know, teacher, social worker, etc. The role they carry out is very much under regulated activity. But when they're outside of their regulated activity work, if they caused harm to a vulnerable adult or child, then they could still be classed as causing harm and therefore they could still be included in a barred list following a referral. OK, and that's one of the ones that causes quite a lot of um, complex discussions because they may have somebody who works in regulated activity, but an incident took place at a weekend when they were outside of their work hours. And people think, well, actually, wait a minute, they weren't carrying out regulated activity at the time of this incident. They were at home with their family or they were with their neighbours or they were on holiday or all that kind of thing. But just because they're outside of regulated activity doesn't mean to say that they cannot be included in the barred lists. OK, that makes sense because that is quite a, a legally worded and um, more complex situation. So if anybody's got any questions around that, please do put them in the chat box um, and then I'll be able to, to put something back to you in writing. So you've got that to refer to and, and sort of like mull over um, after the presentation. 
So number eight, at the end of March 2020, there were more than 75,000 people on one or both barred lists. We think that's true or false. Any takers? Okay, this one's actually true. There were 70,673 people in the children's barred list as of the end of March 2020. And there were 77, 9,021 so it's 77,921 people in one or both <coughs> lists at the end of March. So that's 77,921 people in March 2020 were on a barred list from working with children or adults. That's a lot of people, isn't it, when you, when you hear that figure. Regulators will automatically inform DBS if an individual is banned or struck off from working within their specific sector. I think we touched on this one slightly before. False. False, absolutely. I must get used to not giving you the answers to the later questions and the earlier <laughs> answers. Um, legal duty lies with the regulated activity provider, which we mentioned before, not the regulator. So a law regulator can make a referral to ensure that it is not missed. It's important for the regulated activity provider to make the referral to DBS if it's appropriate to do so. And your classic one there is around um, teaching. So if somebody was struck off or social work, they've got their regulated body and um, they've got their, um, their, you know, their regulators. It's not up to the regulator to make the referral to DBS, especially around if there is a legal duty to refer if the conditions are met. It is down to the employer to make that referral. OK. And then last but not least, once an individual is barred, they can request for this decision to be reviewed on an annual basis. Is that true or false? False. OK, absolutely. That's right. It is false. The, le the legislation that we mentioned before, the Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Act and the Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Order sets out the conditions under which a person can appeal against a barring decision or to appeal against a refusal to remove a person following a review. OK, where a person wishes to appeal against the DBS decision to include them in a barred list, appeals can be lodged with the tribunal only on the grounds that the DBS, DBS has made a mistake. And that can be on a point of law or a finding of fact made by the DBS on which the decision to bar was based. OK, applications for review may only be made with the permission of the DBS and the person may apply for permission only if the application is made after the end of the minimum barred period, which we'll cover again and in the prescribed period ending with the time when the barred person applies for permission they have made no other application okay so again asking to come off the barred lists and having it reviewed and things like that there is quite strict criteria um, around those conditions okay so that's just a little bit of a, a, a bit of a you know information session looking at um, some of the myths that are out there in terms of um, DBS and barred OK, so, sorry, that was my Apple Watch telling me it doesn't understand. Apologies for that. <laughs> Slide eight. Um, we, we covered this one on last week, so for the, apologies for those of you that were here. But it's really important and uh, an element for any organisation in getting right um, your recruitment processes. And it's always important. We always say that it's good that you've got good recruitment practices in place and DBS checks can only pay a, play a part in that process. And it's not to be. We always say do not use a DBS disclosure certificate as your only means of suitability decisions when deciding to employ somebody. OK, so looking at um, the circle very quickly, we'll just go around this because I think the main one that we're wanting to look at here is tell the DBS. But just very quickly for the others, it's about getting the right level of check at the right time. And it's important the right level of check is determined. You can only ask for the detail of information that you're entitled to see. OK, and it's also important to have a recruitment of ex-offenders policy in place 
setting out how you will consider and what you will do if you get that certificate back and there is information on it for previous offences or concerns. OK, so what we see at the DBS is we get quite a few applications for DBS certificates asking for enhanced with barred list checks. But according to the legislation, the individual is not actually entitled to that level of check because of the nature and the work that they do. Again, we'll cover that in regulated activity. OK. So again, when you do get a certificate back, act swiftly on that information. Decide what you need to do with it. Is it something that will prevent you from employing that individual? Or is it something that you can still manage through risk assessment processes, um, through other information that you have about the individual, use of references, etc., etc. OK, um, check all your ID documents and make sure that everything that you've got all falls into place and that there are no gaps. Um, in employment histories and times that are not accounted for. OK, so recognising types of harmful behaviour and conduct. It's important that once someone is imposed, that you have the right processes and procedures in place to ensure that they can recognise harmful behaviour and that you can recognise it. So make it have your policies and processes in place that make it safe and easy for users to disclose information where they need to, whistleblowing policies, etc., etc., appropriate training and appropriate routes for reporting concerns. These all add up to making your recruitment and the running of your organisation safer in terms of safeguarding. And then what we're looking at today, finally consider if you should make a referral to the DBS. If you've removed somebody from regulated activity because they have harmed or posed a risk of harm to the vulnerable, then you have a legal duty to make that referral. OK, tell the DBS and then we're back up at the top again. So if that barred applicant tried to apply for another role, an appropriate check can be made and DBS already has that relevant information. And that's the point. That's the point of it really looking at that in a circular um, action point, because the DBS, and again, we'll come to this towards the end, the DBS will only know and be able to act on the information if somebody tells us, because we don't go out looking for it. We can't investigate. We can only act on the information that somebody submits to us. So we look at making barring referrals. Um, we've touched briefly on the fact that there are three ways of making a barring referral. One is discretionary. And this when somebody contacts the DBS because they have concerns that an individual may have harmed a child or vulnerable adult or put a child or vulnerable adult at risk of harm. And these referrals come from employers, agencies, keepers of registers, supervisory authorities, anybody really who thinks that there is a risk of harm, they've, they've recognised that. And in the discretionary, um, the employee has a right to representation. OK, so what that basically means is that the, the referral will get made, the process will start, the information gathering process will start. And then at some point in that process, the individual will be contacted to say, OK, tell us your side of what's happened and um, let's hear your representation. And the DBS will then use all of that information. We've got Autobar which is um, somebody is convicted or cautioned of an automatic inclusion offence. And these are serious offences where somebody is automatically, they've been in court, they've been convicted, sentenced, and they're automatically barred from working with these groups. OK, serious offences that are set out in law, which require the DBS to bar the individual um, from relative, um, regulated activity in the relevant workforce. So it could be that somebody is barred in one workforce and not the other. Or it could be that they're barred in both. OK. And then we've got disclosure information. And this is when information comes to light because an individual has applied for an enhanced check with one or both barred lists. Because the individual is looking to work in regulated activities, if the PNC identifies particular information, the application will automatically go to barring for consideration as to whether the individual should be considered to be barred. OK, so somebody has um, passed information to the DBS potentially on a previous situation or the police has intelligence, um, but actually no cautions or convictions. And they make that application for that enhanced check with barred lists. That information can come to light. And if it does, the police will make the decision as to whether or not it needs to go to barring for consideration. 
Okay. So the ones mainly that we're going to be looking at today is around the discretionary route, because this is where individuals and organisations like yourselves will um, be considering if you've had an investigation or you've got concerns, you will be thinking about do we need to make a referral to DBS. OK, so who has a legal duty? Um, regulated activity provider employers or voluntary organisations who are responsible for the management or control of regulated activity and make arrangements for people to work in regulated activity. So this falls under your agencies and things like that. So if you are in the agency and you have somebody on your books and you put them into a workforce which is regulated activity, then you are classed as having a legal duty to refer if something happens. All right. Personal supplier, personal suppliers, per employment business, employment agency or an educational institution that makes arrangements with the person with a view to supplying that person to employers to undertake regulated activity. OK, so um, again, these people have a legal duty to refer and the duty, the duty to refer applies irrespective of whether another body has made the referral to DBS in relation to the same person. So remember we touched on before where you might have a regulator, say, for example, um, education workforce. Somebody has been barred from teaching. Education workforce may or may not notify DBS that they have banned that teacher from working with children. But the responsibility will still lie with the regulated activity provider, which potentially would be the school or the local authority to make that referral to DBS irrespective of whether the workforce educator has already done it. Information would rather be received twice than not at all. OK. So we talked before, we touched briefly on two main conditions when you must refer. OK, so when two conditions have been met, condition one is you withdraw permission to engage in um, regulated activity. So dismissed, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the individual has been dismissed from that employment. Redeployed. If somebody is redeployed, it means they have been removed from the regulated activity provision within the organisation and they have been put into another role which does not fall under regulated activity while an investigation is ongoing. OK, and that could be something like somebody who maybe could be frontline is maybe given a desk job or, you know, removed from contact with children and vulnerable adults, etc and given an administration role to carry out, those kind of things would fall under redeployed. OK, retired redundant. It's often felt that the problem has been solved in inverted commas. However, the person may get another job with another employer. And um, again, employers, they, they go on to do volunteering, et cetera, et cetera. But if that person is retired redundant and the investigation is ongoing, they've been in regulated activity, you still have a legal duty to re refer. OK, resigned is the same again. Um, employers often feel that that's OK, the person's gone. We don't need to worry about it. They're, you know, that they're not going to cause any harm. But and they, they resign sometimes before disciplinary action concludes. So they think, OK, well, I may as well go because you're going to sack me anyway. Um, and many employers have said we only had one side, so we didn't think we could refer. Absolutely not. If somebody has resigned, even though there's an investigation ongoing, et cetera, et cetera, you could still fall under that legal duty to refer. Okay. So resignation, redundancy, retirement, laterally circumstances where you would have dismissed if they hadn't have left first or transferred to a position which is not regulated activity, withdrawing permission does not include suspension. OK, the only exception could be a bail scenario where the employer is hindered in dismissal, waiting for progression of a case to prosecution. OK, so if the police, if there's a police investigation ongoing, it may be that you decide that you're not going to dismiss or that you're not going to take any disciplinary action till the end of that. But you still need to keep in mind whether you meet your legal duty to refer to DBS. OK, condition two, you think the person has either engaged in relevant conduct, satisfied the harm test or received a caution for or a conviction for or being convicted of a relevant offence. OK, they engaged in relevant conduct. We are going to look at relevant conduct. OK, we mean conduct that endangers or is likely to endanger 
or conduct, if repeated against or in relation to a child or adult, would endanger them or be likely to endanger them. And it's also important to consider it's not only that a person may have harmed, their actions may have indirectly caused harm and it may have put somebody at risk. OK, and they may have attempted and failed or they may have tried to incite others to cause harm. OK, we want to look at a little bit more and we will come on to regulated activity again. Um, relevant conduct and the harm test. So looking at regulated activity, OK, this table um, will help you to decide if an activity is regulated activity. The what, the how, the often and the supervision all has an effect on whether somebody is actually employed in regulated activity or not. OK, so if we look at, say, providing health care, provide health care by a health care professional or someone acting under their direct direction or supervision. OK, so if the health care that's being provided, it only needs to happen once it falls under regulated activity. If it happens more than three days in a 30 day period, it falls under regulated activity. And if it happens once overnight with the opportunity for contact between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., it falls under regulated activity. OK, so it doesn't have to be all three. It can be one of these. So if it is something that somebody does an overnight activity and it falls into that last column, as in between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., then it falls under it's a regulated activity that they're employed in. The same with personal care, where help is provided with eating, drinking because a child is ill or has a disability. OK, or help where help is provided with toileting, washing, dressing because of a child's age, illness and or disability. Okay, so then looking at supervision to a level which removes the risk to the child or children, it needs to be consideration given to the age, awareness and availability of the children. OK, so you teach and training instruction if it's unsupervised, if it happens once, it's not classed as um, regulated activity. But if it's more than three days in a 30 day period, yes, it is. And if it's overnight, yes, it is. OK. Caring or supervising is the same as in providing advice, advice, providing advice or guidance on physical, emotional, educational well-being. OK, so if those three either supervised, unsupervised happened once, then it's not regulated. But if it happens more three times in a 30 day period or once overnight, then it is. So again, it's thinking about what is the activity, who is doing it, who's supervising, what is the activity? How often is it happening? All of these things need to be taken into consideration when you're looking to see whether this person is doing regulated activity. OK. Driving children under an arrangement. Driving does not include personal arrangements between parents. OK, but it does include if there is an arrangement put in place. Sometimes we have driving scenarios where arrangements are put in place by the local authority to transport a child to school, and that includes pupil referral units, etc. So again, if it happened a one off occasion, they're not that those drivers are not in regulated activity. If it happened more than three days in a 30 day period, they are in regulated activity. OK, so if it was more than three days over that, say, you know, 30 day period equates to more or less a month, um, then yes, they would be. OK, online chat rooms, again, if it's more than three days in a 30 day period, um, yes, it's regulated activity. OK, there are different rules for those aged 16 and 17 who are in employment, teaching, training, instruction, caring for, supervising or providing advice, guidance are not regulated activity if provided in the course of employment. So a 16 and 17 year old, if they were carrying out those activities, would not be classed as regulated activity. Bit confusing, but it, it it's not something that if you're not already familiar with that you're going to get your head around in a day or in this hour and a half presentation. So again, any questions on regulated activity, please pop them in the chat room and Patrick will forward them over to me. So if we look at somebody does not meet the criteria for what they do which in the previous slide, we also then need to consider where they work. OK, 
These places that you can see on the screen are set out in legislation because of their purpose in relation to children. And individuals working in these places may not be carrying out one of the activities listed on the previous slide, but must satisfy all of the rules to be considered in regulated activity. So an example, a school caretaker who would be in regulated activity if they have the opportunity for contact with pupils, even though they do not work directly with them. But because they would work in an establishment that has access to children, we need to look at where the establishment is as well and what is the um, what is the purpose of that establishment. OK, so if we have a caretaker who does not work directly with children, but the activity for his job takes place in a school. And then if we look at the second box, they work there more than three days in a 30 day period or overnight between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. They have the opportunity for contact with the children, even though they don't work directly with them. The caretaker works there for the purpose of the establishment because he's there to look after the school and clean the school and the school's the purpose of the establishment. And it is not a temporary or occasional role or a supervised volunteer role Then that caretaker would fall under regulated activity. So it's not because of the job he's doing, it's because of the specified establishment that he works in. Okay. So regulated activity for adults. Um, healthcare is pretty much the same as it was for regulated activity with children. The definition for personal care for adults is different, mind, to the definition for children. It includes age, illness, disability in terms of eating, drinking, toileting, washing and dressing, oral care, care of skin, hair or nails for health reasons only. And what we might hear, what we might have here is somebody coming in to say a, um, a beautician may come in to um, on a weekly basis or a fortnightly basis to care for elderly residents and come in and maybe do their nails for them. It's a bit of a treat. It's a nice thing to happen um, and it's cosmetic. It's something it's a, it's got that feel good factor for them. That would not fall under regulated activity for adults. If we had a healthcare professional coming in, say a chiropodist that needed to come in and to do care for nails um, for a health reason to um, potentially stop infections or to stop um, nails getting too long because the individual would scratch and cut themselves or use it for self-harm, etc., they would be classed as regulated activity. Although both occasions they're coming in to do their nails, they are for very different reasons. OK, assistance is because of the person's age, illness and disability and does not include general housework or befriending. Assistance with conduct of the adults affairs. This suitability decision is made by Office of Public Guardian. And if they decide to invoke their right to do so, um, that can be classed as um, regulated activity, which is your power of attorneys and things like that. Conveying includes ambulance drivers, hospital porters, air ambulance, etc. It must be to, from or between healthcare, personal care or social work appointments and must be an arrangement via a third party, i.e. not a friend or a family member. So that links in with the children as well, doesn't it? If you've got your neighbour who's taking somebody elderly um, to, a, to a hospital appointment or a GP appointment, they don't fall under regulated activity. But if the hospital has provided that hospital transport to pick that person up and take them, that driver would then fall under regulated activity because they've been, it's an arrangement by a third party and official um, set up. OK. So we're just going to have a quick look at this one. Um, regulated activity, yes or no. A charity helpline is set up wholly or mainly for children and provides advice and guidance to children on their emotional, physical and educational well-being. The helpline call handlers provide this advice and guidance once a week. Do we think this is regulated activity or not? Any takers? OK, this one actually is regulated activity because they're providing advice and guidance to children once a week, which falls within, if you think back to the table, it falls within that three times within a 30 day period. 
And in terms of advice and children, it's it's that that time frame that makes it fall under it. OK, next one. An individual offers to do their elderly neighbour shopping as a personal arrangement. Do we think this one falls under regulated activity or not? No. No, absolutely, it, it doesn't. That's right. And um, because it's a personal arrangement, what they what that individual can do is anybody can apply for a basic DBS check. So if somebody wants to do that for protection of themselves and to, you know, to get involved in help in community and things like that, they're absolutely entitled to do that. But it doesn't fall under regulated activity. OK, the next one, Laura is a hospital porter who moves adult patients around hospital grounds. Regulated activity, yes or no? Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Anyone who transport adults on behalf of an organisation to and from or between anywhere they receive health care, social work, appointments or personal care um, is in regulated activity. OK, Mohammed is a care worker and attends to Danny who suffers from dementia. He visits Danny daily to prompt him to eat and take his medication. He also prompts him to wash regularly and supervises. OK, is Mohammed in regulated activity or not? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, that was a definite yes resounding there on that one. Um, absolutely. Yes, he is. He's physically assisting and prompting as they are unable to make the decision to do these things for themselves. An adult with eating, drinking, going to the toilet, washing, dressing, oral care and care of the skin, hair or nails, which is the definition that makes him fall under regulated activity. A couple more. Josh has a running group for 11 to 15 year olds. He trains the children twice a month on a Sunday morning in the local park. Is Joshua doing regulated activity? Yes. OK, this one is actually no, because he doesn't meet the period conditions, as in more than three times in a 30 day period or once a week between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m because he's doing it twice a month. If he was doing it three times a month, he would fall under regulated activity. But because he's only doing it twice a month, then he doesn't. But because he is working with children, he would be entitled to go for an enhanced check. He wouldn't be entitled to get a barred list because of the work that he's doing. Leona is a parent who volunteers at her child's school reading with the children. She does this every Tuesday and Thursday morning. Is Leona in regulated activity? Any takers? No. No. OK, this one actually she is in regulated activity because she meets the frequency test and would have the opportunity for contact with children in the establishment. So although she's a parent who volunteers at her school, she does it every Tuesday and every Thursday. So she's doing it more than three times in the 30 day period. OK, so you can see where the conditions come in and you've really got to think about whether this individual falls into that category or not. OK, she volunteers for the purpose of the establishment of the school. So if we think about what we looked at specified establishments, so although she's a volunteer, she falls under the category of specified establishment and she's meeting. If I just go back a couple, go back here, she's working more than three days in the 30 day period. She has the opportunity for contact with the children. The work that she is doing is for the purpose of the establishment and it's not a temporary role or a supervised volunteer role. She hasn't got a supervisor in there, so she's just going in as a volunteer to read to the children. So because she's working in a specified establishment of the school, she satisfies all of the other criteria. She is classed as being in regulated activity. OK. So that was just a few examples there to, to have a look at. So we've mentioned relevant conduct. Um, Relevant conduct, I'm going to read it out, but it is just exactly what it says on the slide. Um, relevant conduct is conduct which endangers a child or adult or is likely to endanger a child or adult. 
if repeated against or in relation to a child or an adult would endanger the child or adult or be likely to endanger the child or adult. Involve sexual material relating to children, including possession of such material. Involve sexually explicit images depicting violence against human beings, including possession of such images. Is of a sexual nature involving a child or an adult. OK, so that is relevant conduct. That's the definition of it. So when we look at harm, a person's conduct endangers a child or adult if they harm a child or adult, cause a child or adult to be harmed, put a child or adult at risk of harm, attempt to harm a child or adult or incite another to harm a child or adult. Okay. So what I'm going to ask you to do here is just spend a couple of minutes thinking about your own organisation or your own sector, the work that you do, the volunteering that you do, and think of an example. Can you come up with an example of each of those bullet points, as in um, harming, cause, put a child, attempt or incite? If you've got any examples that you could come up with, um, that would be great. I'll just take a couple of minutes. Um, I've only been with the organisation for four weeks. Oh, so, bless. <laughs> so, well done for being here. <laughs> so do you mind if I don't engage in this one because it's part of my induction? Yep, that's absolutely fine. That's Thank absolutely you. Fine. OK, does anybody want to have a stab at throwing some out? Some examples that they've come up with? Has anybody got any examples in terms of harming a child or an adult? No, no thought. Um, I have one from a previous organisation that I used to work for. Absolutely. It was mm -hmm. um, a major charity working with older people. Uh -huh. And there was signs of very uh, serious abuse uh, taking place in the home. Okay. And um, the volunteer, you know, brought it up straight away. And um, the abuse was within the family. Mm -hmm. It was not only physical abuse, it was emotional and financial as well. Excellent. Yeah. So it's looking outside that physical, isn't it? It's looking yes. outside of it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, um, it was how the older person let them know was basically um, writing on toilet paper, just saying help. Right. Okay. And um, of course, as soon as we knew, we had to um, act straight away. The police social services were brought in. The older person was taken out of the home and put in a safe environment and never returned and it went to court. Right. OK, so there's very clear um, a conduct there. There's very clear conduct within that family unit, <coughs> the sounds of it, that has caused not only that physical harm, but as you say, the financial and the, the emotional harm as yeah. well yeah. To, <clears throat> to that adult. Yeah. OK. So again, you know, we, we hear reports on the TV of investigations into homes and things like that, where residents can be pushed, um, you know, they're handled roughly, all that kind of thing. So, you know, um, smacking a child, um, locking children in rooms, things like that can all be harm to an adult or child. OK, have we got any examples of cause a child or adult to be harmed? As opposed to the actual harm actually cause a child so there's a slight difference okay so one of the examples that we use um when we're looking at this presentation is about not supervising to um, children during a school trip 
This might result in the child to be harmed. The child could go missing. Um, they could have accidents and things like that. So causing a child or adult to be harmed is, would be inappropriate supervision in terms of that child's needs and well-being. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Um, so putting a child at risk of harm. Child, sorry, child or adult at risk of harm. OK, so this this links pretty much to the last one as well, causing a child or adult to be harmed and um, putting a child at risk or harm would be example, say, in a nursing home or residential sleeping during a waking night shift. So where you're supposed to have that supervision of that adult and have responsibility for that adult's care or that child's care, you're putting them at risk of harm, even though no harm has been caused by sleeping on a waking night shift. You're actually putting them at risk of harm. Um, because you're not there, you're not doing the job that you're employed to do. Attempt to harm a, a child or an adult. OK, this could be something where, um, again, residential or, you know, um, in the community where somebody attempts to push a resident in anger or something like that. And somebody else intervenes and stops that act from actually taking place. Um, the fact that they attempted to harm somebody or somebody that maybe threatens and goes to hit a child, but another parent steps in the way um, and prevents that from happening. So attempt to harm a child or an adult and inciting another to harm a child or an adult. What do we think could fall under that one? Inciting another to harm a child or an adult. OK, this could be a situation where, for example, again, I'm going to come back to sort of like residential care and things like that. And, um, you know, um, some workers may say, oh, do you know what? Um, let's double pad that resident. And that means then that we don't have to go back in an hour. We can leave it for two hours before we go back in and see them. So if somebody is actually saying something to somebody else or advising them or inciting them to do something which potentially can cause harm, then that's inciting another to harm a child or an adult. And you also very much get that incitement in terms of pornography when it comes to the sharing of pictures um, and things like that, which is inciting, can be inciting another person to cause harm um, to a child or an adult. OK, so there's various different examples that we could use for that one. OK. So looking at the harm test, which we've mentioned, so we've got our relevant conduct and then we've also got our harm test. And the harm test is satisfied when relevant conduct cannot be established, but it appears to the DBS that a person may harm a child or adult who is in receipt of regulated activity. Okay, Cause a child or adult who is in receipt of regulated activity to be harmed. Put a child or adult who is in receipt of regulated <coughs> activity at risk of harm. Attempt to harm a child or adult who is in receipt of regulated activity or incite another to harm a child or adult who is in receipt of regulated activity. So you can see where the harm test links with the definitions of harm on the previous slide. So it's actually har harming, causing putting a child or adult at risk, attempting to harm or inciting another. OK, not everything needs to be an action. All right. And I think this is something that's really important to remember. Sometimes people express thoughts and feelings which, if acted upon, would cause or put someone at risk of harm. So an example of that is if someone disclosed to a colleague that they're having thoughts of a sexual nature about children in their care, this would be considered by DBS as a risk of potential future harm, even if they had not acted on that thought at that time. The mere fact that they're having the thoughts could be um, considered by DS, DBS as a risk of potential future harm. Okay. So if you remember around DBS, we don't have to prove beyond all reasonable doubt. DBS works on the balance of probabilities. OK. So this slide is just about some examples of what is harm. OK, and harm is not defined in legislation, but DBS view harm as its common understanding of the definition um, that you may find in a dictionary. And harm is considered in its widest context and may include 
you know, all of the examples that we've talked about and the things that are in these slides. I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes just to run through and have a look at some of the things that are in here. You can see from those lists, there's quite a lot of things that fall under abuse and harm. And I think one of the ones that comes out most surprising to a lot of people really sometimes is that neglect or that omission. It's the omission of. So say, for example, if you have a child who um, says that they have a sore mouth and um, parent, carer, whichever says, oh, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. You've probably just bit your tongue or you've done this, or you've done that. Not seeking that appropriate medical care for that child is actually classed as neglect. And because some of these things do happen on a day to day basis, people see them as the norm and they don't recognise, well, actually, this person is um, being caused harm by the omission or the failure to act on something. Is there anything in any of that slide that comes out as quite surprising for anybody? Or does it all kind of make sense when you look under the, each of the headings? Does it all kind of make sense to everybody? I'll take silence as a yes, hopefully. <laughs> It's very difficult because when I'm presenting, I can't see anybody and you guys can only see the presentation slide. So it's really difficult because it's like I'm talking to my own computer screen, <laughs> knowing that you're all there in the background of it. I'm sorry, I had mine on and mute. I have been saying yes to myself. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, thank you for that. That's good. I think we've recognised that the most famous saying for 2020 and 2021 is you're on mute, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> OK. So um, we've we've looked at the different routes that we can make barring referrals. And as I say, the main ones that will be in consideration for you guys will be that discretionary route. We've looked at regulated activity. We've looked at relevant conduct. We've looked at the harm test and whether you've got a legal duty to refer or not. And the fact that even if you don't have a legal duty to refer, if you believe the harm test has been satisfied, or if you believe that person to be a risk of harm to children or vulnerable adults, whether inside regulated activity at the time of the incident, offence, whichever, or outside of regulated activity, then you either have a legal duty to make a referral to DBS or you can do so because they've satisfied the other relevant criteria, i.e. the harm test, etc. OK, so when a referral then is made to DBS and um, stage one will be to look at whether or not um, the person is engaged in regulated activity of vulnerable adults or there is evidence of relevant conduct. And the test for regulated activity is who has been or might be in the future engaged in regulated activity. The regulated activity does play quite a huge part in your assessments whenever you're sending something in, because that will be the first thing that will be looked at in terms of do they meet the criteria for a referral. Stage two will then be looking at information gathering and assessment. And I think it's really important to note that DBS cannot investigate. OK, what they can do is they can gather information. So what the information tells us, are there any allegations that can be proven on the balance of probabilities? Is it appropriate to progress the case further, assessment of evidence and identify and establish the facts? So when I come on to looking with you about what makes a good referral, this stage two is really, really important because the more information that you provide up front and the better quality of that information means that the DBS can progress that, that referral through to the next stage because, as I say, DBS cannot investigate. They can only gather information. So if you don't send it to us, how are we meant to know? Okay. 
Looking at stage three, is there a risk of harm in the future? How serious is that risk? Would a barring decision be proportionate to the response to that risk? OK, so they look at and this is a very basic diagram that I'm showing you at the moment. They look at um, all the information and they then start to look at and make judgments around the risk. A, what has happened and what is the future risk of that individual um, carrying on? I mentioned before under the discretionary route that um, individuals who are sent for referral have got the right to representation. OK, and at stage four, they have eight weeks and two days. Don't ask me why the two days. I'm not really sure it's set out in legislation, but they have eight weeks and two days <laughs> to um, verbally put verbal reps in or written reps subject to certain criteria. And when they are they're notified in the first instance that a referral has been made and when they are then sent for asking for their representations, they will be told in that letter and um, the criteria around what they can submit. And then we get to stage five, which is the barring decision. OK, and that appropriateness is based on future risk to vulnerable groups. And that is set out in the legislation of the Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Act. OK, so it has to be looked on what is the appropriateness based on future risk. So the barring decision is not done purely on what has happened. It's based on what potentially could happen if this person goes on to carry on working in regulated activity with children and vulnerable adults. Okay. Then we've got what we mentioned, which the auto bar with representation. There are very, very few offences that are allowed representation, and that again is set out in law. And with an auto bar, we don't do stage one, two and three. It just goes straight to stage four in certain circumstances. There is no consideration. There is no looking at information gathering. It's straight from the police. This person has been convicted of this offence and they are barred in these criteria. And there, as I say, there are few occasions that representation can be made. And if it is an auto bar without representation, we get notified on a weekly basis from PNC and that goes straight to stage five. The person is automatically barred there and then from their conviction. OK, so that's around the, defer the referral making process. Reviews after minimum barring period, which will come on to or at any time after statutory conditions are met, reviews can take place. DBS has the power to grant a review at any time, provided that new information is available. There's been a change in the circumstances of the barred individual or there has been an error made by the DBS. OK. There are minimum barring periods for under 18s. They can be barred for one year, 18 to 25. The minimum is five years. And for anybody over 25, the minimum barring period is 10 years. OK, so again, it's all set out in legislation that we have to abide by. Barring decision process may vary according to the nature of the referral. I think that's, you know, basically that's every case is looked at within its own merit. OK, so what does a good equality referral look like? OK, the, it's, it's vital that you understand that when you should refer to DBS, both in terms of recognise the instances where a referral is appropriate, but knowing when you have sufficient information to make the referral is also important. And there's a balance to be made between making sure you have enough information to give us and the risk that exists while the process is progressing. If in doubt, you can always contact us for advice. And I have had quite a few um, queries from local authorities and um, from voluntary organisations about we're thinking about this person. This is the scenario. Do we bar? Do we make a referral to bar or do we not? And one thing that I will say is that you can always contact us for that discussion and I would be your point of contact, but I cannot tell you, yes, you must make a barring referral or no, you can't. What I will do is I will talk through with you the criteria um, for you to come to a decision as to whether you feel based on the information you have, whether that criteria has been met or not. But I cannot tell you, yes, you must refer but I will go through each individual step with you. Like we've talked about some of the information today and then by the end of the conversation and the ones that I've had so far, um, it has been very clear to those inquiries that, well, actually, yes, we do meet the criteria. So yes, we do think we need to put a referral in. 
um, or no, actually we don't because we haven't met this this area, um, etc. Okay, so I would be your point of contact if you've got any um, queries or want any discussions on it. So good quality referral um, is timely. Okay, balance the need for a swift response with the need for sufficient documentary supporting evidence. All right. We do need sometimes what will happen is that people, as soon as an investigation is started, they will notify DBS and they will bang a referral in. What have the DBS got to work with if you haven't done any of that investigatory process? OK, so what we ask for is copies of statements, copies of job descriptions, application forms, everything like that. But you need to balance what you've got available and what you know will be coming as to what time you put that referral in. OK, an accurate and fully completed referral form. And we mentioned before recognition of any gaps, if there's any gaps present, if there's a gap in employment history or if there's a gap in the information, provide some information around that as to why that gap is there. Okay. Chronology, de detail the sequence of events from the initial notification of the incident to the final outcome. OK, and I think in Wales, a lot of people, you know, you've got your Section 5 procedures um, where, where you would investigate if it was another professional, etc. All of those copies of minutes, copies of notes, copies of interviews, everything like that is all useful when you submit your referral to DBS. Anything relevant at all to facilitate, facilitate the DBS decision making process, and that might go as far back to when you first employed or took that person on board. You may there may have been something that came back on the certificate and you felt the risk was actually managed through a risk assessment was appropriate. Copies of that risk assessment process, copies of job descriptions, copies of application forms. Everything is all relevant. What was the impact on the victim? OK, what was what was the you know, was it we looked at the different categories about causing harm, inciting and um, potential risk of harm, things like that. What was the impact? What actually happened? This is what we want to report. And it sounds it sounds facetious to say it, but it really is that so what question. So this is what we're reporting in. So what what happened from it? What was the impact? What was the potential impact from that incident that you want to refer in for? Training and supervision records. And this is the one that people think, well, why do you want the individual's training records? Because they will be able to see then actually this person has been trained. They do have the knowledge. They do have the know how to be able to decide, well, actually, that approach, that behaviour was inappropriate. OK, so all these things are quite relevant and important to send in. And any internal and external investigative and dis disciplinary processes, including we've mentioned interviews, police intervention, multi-agency meetings, Include recruitment and additional employment information, i.e. any previous misconducts or complaints. OK, you can still make a referral to DBS, even though you might have um, carried out investigations and under your Section 5 come out with an unsubstantiated outcome. You can still refer to DBS, even though the outcome of any proceedings is unsubstantiated if you believe that that person still satisfies the harm test and is a concern in their behaviour. Okay, So again, legal duty may not be met. You might have an unsubstantiated outcome for an investigation. You can still refer to DBS and we have a legal duty to follow through on any referral that is made to us. Um, it might end up being closed to any of those five stages that we looked at on the last slide, but it's better that we do have the information than we don't, because what DBS may have is that they may have a referral from another um, body for the same in, for the same individual. And what would happen is that that information would be put together to make that decision as to whether that individual should be barred or not. OK, so ever in doubt, um, either contact us for that discussion or put your referral in. OK, Mr Yellow was a support worker. He often made rude jokes to other staff in front of vulnerable service users. Mr Yellow was also reported to shout at residents when they did not do as he asked. A complaint was made and Mr Yellow was invited to an investigatory meeting. Mr Yellow did not attend and resigned. OK, so which documents do you think would be useful to send through to the DBS? Policy and procedure documentation. Absolutely. Uh huh. Yep. 
Anything else? The complaint. Uh huh. The yep. investigatory meeting. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What about his letter of resignation? If he provided that in a letter, would that be yeah. useful? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And anything at all that has been done, you know, his. Um, it says here that he was a support worker. He made rude jokes to other staff in front of vulnerable service users. OK, shouted at residents when they did not do as they asked. But what it doesn't say as to whether those service users and I, I've got to be honest, I don't like that term service users. Um, but shouted at residents, etc. That doesn't say whether they are children or vulnerable adults. OK, so the reason we ask for job descriptions um, and application forms is that there may be information in somebody's application form of previous work history. And that individual may have worked previously with adults or they may have worked previously with children. Now, if that individual at that time is carrying out that conduct, but is only working with one or the other of those two groups, but application forms tell us about work history and we can see, well, actually they have a history of working with children as well. And we can we cannot investigate, but we can gather information. OK, and we would also then be able to consider whether this individual poses a risk to both groups or whether just one or the other. OK, so information is key, really, in terms of when you make your barring referral. The more information you can put up front, the safe, the safer your, your safeguarding referral is going to be. OK, because we can only make decisions based on the information that we are given. OK, so here's some documents um, job description, application form, training record, certificates of all the training that he's completed um, witness statements, complaints, any record of previous misconduct. Um, any support plans, the, the individual, the service user, again, um, their support plan. OK, and the only part of that support plan that you need to put in is if they've got a care plan or um, something like that is the part that is relevant to the incident that's happened. OK, because if their plan quite clearly sets out their level of care in terms of the incident that has happened, then that is a direct um, correlation that they can see that on the balance of probabilities, this individual did not follow that care plan. So again, that person's individual support plan is useful. Not the whole thing, just the part that's relevant to what's being referred in. Information of other organisations who have been informed of Mr Yellow's behaviour and any multi-agency meeting minutes. OK, so if you've had around the table, say, a strategy meeting and there have been other agencies in attendance at that meeting, details of those organisations are really, really key because, as I say, we cannot investigate but we can go out to those organisations and gather information and they may have something that you might not have. So um, again, appraisal information, any one to one meetings and um, discussing his inappropriate contact and um, his annual appraisal information, one to one records, because that will show if there's any information in there that has hinted or um, potentially shown a risk or the fact that he is of completely previous good conduct. Um, resident complaints, statements of him shouting, so all the you know the impacts that we were talking about before, the letter inviting him to his meeting, any HR policies which you guys have mentioned, which is fab, um, including your disciplinary procedure, recruitment process, and whistleblowing policy, any video evidence of Mr. Yellow's conduct. So a lot of places now have CCTV in situ, um, and then obviously his resignation letter. And if there's no letter, if you've got a record of his phone call, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so sometimes people get put off making that referral because if you can see there, DBS do want quite a lot of information when you look at gathering all of that stuff together. But I think what that needs to balance out against on the other side of it is the reason why you're doing that process. And that is to protect and save from harm a child or a vulnerable adult in the future. And to me, if we keep that focus in our minds, then no amount of paperwork is too much. And um, if, if we get that positive result um, at the end of it and we can protect somebody um, moving forward. 
So things to consider. Legibility, we've talked about in the documents, um, but sometimes it's difficult to decipher information if it's on handwritten statements. So again, organisations might think, oh, we've got the original handwritten one here, we'll submit that rather than the typed up copy. Submit both, because if DBS get the handwritten one and they can't read it, then at least they've got the handwritten copy to fall back on, but they can do that correlation and see that the typed up copy is the version of the written one. So don't think that we don't want to send two things of the same thing. Always send the original plus a typed copy if you can. Quality of a document, again, if there's something that's scanned, make sure that it is legible before you send it in, because if it's not, it can't be used. And redaction. Um, are we all familiar with what redaction is, where information has to be taken out of a document before it can be submitted? The example that's on screen here is a true example of a document that DBS received on a referral. And with the information, the amount of information that's been redacted, DBS were not able to use that document in any way, shape or form because it didn't tell them anything. As you can see, I think there's one line. That, that is readable in the whole document. So again, think about what's being sent in. OK, so it's important not to over redact a document. Um, as I say, this is an example that we received. Um, DBS went back to the organisation who then supplied a non redacted version and the DBS were then able to use that to make a balance of probability findings and that person was barred. But if the DBS had have stuck with that original document, that person would not have potentially have been barred from working with children. OK, if you're redacting names, Please provide initials or child one, child two, etc. So there has been a case where every name in the report had been redacted, which indicated to the DBS child one had been one child had been harmed. However, there was in fact four children. But again, due to the excessive redaction of the information, it was not possible to determine that in the first instance. OK. DBS will send out the evidence they have relied upon to the referred person if a minded to bar decision is made. OK, the DBS will also go through a redaction process by the caseworker and the dedicated redaction team. Again, so the information that you send in may be redacted, but before the DBS barring team send out to the person with a minded to bar division de decision letter, they will also go through it and redact anything that they feel inappropriate that goes out to the individual. OK. So final thought, really, there's a lot of information that I've given you out there on quite a few slides. Um, I, I, I'm not going to make any apologies for it because I think it is all really important information in terms of safeguarding. And as I say, I am available if anybody wants to come back to me with any questions or any wants to go through anything any further. But a final thought, really, if you don't make the referral to DBS, who will? OK, and if you don't make the referral to DBS, how will we know? If people don't tell us, we don't know that that individual potentially is a risk. If we don't make the referral to DBS, the person may go on to cause further harm to a vulnerable person, child or adult. If you do make a referral to DBS, and I had a discussion with this on, with somebody yesterday who was concerned about it. If you do make a referral to DBS, we will consider all of the evidence when deciding whether or not the person should be barred. OK, and we will only bar them from working with vulnerable groups if it is the right thing to do. OK, the incident that I had yesterday was the criteria was met for this organisation to um, legally refer to DBS. However, the individual circumstances were such that they, the organisation felt it was quite harsh to refer. So they were pondering between this feels quite harsh because of this individual circumstances, but yet we've got a legal duty. How do we balance that out? How do we get around that? If the legal duty is there to refer or you've got a concern for the person, put your referral in. It's not your decision whether to bar or not. All you're doing is providing information and the, the debarring team will only bar somebody if it's the right and appropriate thing to do. And it's like we said before, set out in the Vulnerable Groups Act. There has to be that ongoing risk that that person will cause harm or has a potential to cause harm. OK. 
So impact of being barred from regulated activity across the UK. So if you're on the children's barred list, not allowed to engage in regulated activity with children in England, Wales or Northern Ireland. Adult, not allowed to engage in regulated activity with vulnerable adults in England, Wales, Northern Ireland. And it is a criminal offence to work, seek work or to offer to work in regulated activity when you're barred on the relevant list. OK. And is it a criminal offence for a person to permit an individual they know or have reason to believe is barred from regulated activity to engage in regulated activity? And the maximum penalty for that is five years imprisonment on a fine. OK, and the bar also applies to regulated work in Scotland. As I mentioned before, in terms of eligibility, there are different rules for Scotland and Northern Ireland. But in terms of barring, this is the impact across the UK jurisdictions. OK, mentioned before, there are lots of information leaflets and further guidance on our dbs.gov.uk website. So you've got your DBS guidance leaflets and they cover all sorts of things. They cover regulated activity with children and um, regulated activity with adults. They are available in both English and Welsh versions on our website. Um, you've got DBS barring referral guidance and um, the referral form, etc. And again, further information. And there is a video that you can watch on how to make a good quality barring referral. And the video is actually produced by the manager from the barring team. So it's really, really informative and it's a really good one to watch. OK, and um, Patrick has these presentation slides, as he said, is recorded and they will get sent out. How to contact us. Um, we've got different addresses there. Um, I'm the Regional Outreach Officer for Wales, as I've mentioned, so I've put my email address on there if anybody wants to drop me an email. Um, or if I'm on leave, if you get that out of office response, I will always put an out of office response on if I'm on leave. If you get that and you've got an urgent query, then always use the one above DBS engagement at dbs.gov.uk because one of my colleagues will pick that query up and deal with it for me in my absence. Um, but if you don't get that, then obviously I will receive it. So you can either come to myself in terms of any queries or if you have specific queries in relation to barring, you've got an email address there and a helpline number. What I will say is if you are doing an online referral and you have difficulties with the online portal, which, uh, you know, cards on the table, we do get some feedback, so it can be a bit hit and miss. Um, and that is being looked at at the moment, you can email your referral to that DBS dispatch at dbs.gov.uk email address and it will still reach the same people, the same team within the same time frame. But we do encourage people to try and use the portal if you can, because you can actually upload all your documents that you need to send in. OK, and then anything on disclosure, that's our general customer service line. And again, if you want the customer service line in Welsh language where it's got 190 at the end of it, you just replace that with 191 and you will get that in Welsh language. 